All right, let's get started. Good morning. Uh, my name is Josh Beach, and I'm from the University of Texas at San Antonio. I teach in the uh, writing department there. Today I'm going to be speaking about the textbook and how we can revision it um, as a new technology, this very old technology, how we can kind of rethink it in light of new technology, how we can transform it into something that is fulfilling its older roles at the same time can be doing some new roles as well. I want to kind of talk about what a textbook is to begin with, a uh, brief history of textbook. And then I want to kind of talk about knowledge, which is what textbooks contain. I want to kind of talk about knowledge from a theoretical perspective, but also from a practical perspective in terms of teaching and learning. Uh, if you were to construct a textbook, if you were to write your own textbook, what do you need to be aware of in terms of what goes in a textbook and how they should be constructed? And then I want to briefly talk about teaching, which is the larger educational context in which a textbook is used in order to teach students and get them to learn. And then I want to move into talking about revisioning the textbook. Um, the textbook has been transforming over the last 25 years or so with new technologies. I want to kind of briefly talk about some of the new technologies that are transforming the textbook. And then I want to focus on one, which is the website, which is the specific focus of a textbook that I've created, and I think it has some unique um, attributes that make it better than the other forms. And then I want to kind of show you with the time remaining um, some parts of that online textbook, which you can find at this web address, which is on that card that I gave you if you want to go there early, and then just uh, address some questions and comments that you might have. All right, the textbook. Uh, why do we have them? Well, we have them because it's tradition, and tradition plays a big role in everything that humans do. A lot of what we do, we do because people have done it before. and We don't think about it, we just do it. Um, that's how culture works. So there's kind of three ways that textbooks are tradition. One is it's a traditional technology. The physical book has been around in its current stage for about, I don't know, 500 years almost, and longer if we think about older forms of paper and scrolls and whatnot. But information has been transformed in this way for hundreds and hundreds of years. And simply, we do it because that's the way it's done. That's the way that we were taught in school. And so most of us as, as teachers or when we share information, we do it either orally or we do it by a book. Uh, it's also a business. Uh, it has been a big business. The book selling business is shrinking and becoming less profitable, although the textbook business still remains a highly profitable business. Uh, we have textbooks because people make money, and that's one of the primary drivers of textbooks is to make money as a business. And I think in our current environment, this is something, especially for educators, that we need to be very aware of, and I think it's interfering with the quality of textbooks, and it's interfering with the long-term interests of our students. And that's one of the reasons why I want to talk about websites as an alternative. Books are also an authoritative candidate of knowledge. And in terms of education, this is one of the most important traditional aspects of the textbook or the book. It's the place where you get authoritative knowledge. It tells you what is true, what is false, what is right, what is wrong. You open the book, that's what you need to know. That's what you need to do. Now, in the pre-modern eras, uh, books were authored by authorities. And they could be cultural authorities in terms of, say, for example, the Bible that was either authored by God or authored by God's representatives. The Bible literally is the book. Um, as a title, and so you would go to the book that your culture said contained everything you needed to know. You didn't question, you know, why this book, or are there other books? You just, there's the book, there's the information, you read it, you memorize it, case closed. Now, since the 18th century, um, with the rise of science and democracy, there was a different conception of the book, still, though, utilizing this notion of traditional authority. Um, the new conception was a book that contained all of the newly collected and, and um, created scientific facts. And this was the grand notion of the encyclopedia, to put all of the facts that scientists could uncover and create in one book or one collection of books, and then every knowledgeable person could read this one book, and that's all you needed to know. And it would also be a way, a, a way for scientists to kind of interact with each other because it would be a common touchstone. So the book as an authoritative, authoritative canon of knowledge. It contains what everyone in a certain culture or subculture needs to know. What do we do with textbooks? Well, there's kind of three things that textbooks convey to students or to a broader audience. One is
as facts. They, they contain information about what is true or false in the world. And this distinction between truth and falsity, it's again a newer distinction that arose in the 18th century, really wasn't all that important before that time. But for the most part, we, we turn to books, we turn to textbooks because they tell us what is true, what's going on in our world. Textbooks also are a way to transmit practical knowledge in the form of activities. And so often, but not always, a textbook will contain activities in terms of like a workbook where students are able to kind of do things. And that's a way for them to either memorize the facts and learn those facts, or uh, the textbook could also be teaching things that are not conceptual information like activities, and so that would be a way to practice that activity. The third thing that textbooks convey are ideal forms. They model knowledge or they model activity. They show you not just how, or, or not just uh, facts, but how the facts were created. They show you the proper way to talk about those facts. They show you the proper way to write about those facts. They, they show you the proper way to do a particular activity or even to think about the information that's being presented. So these are the three things that textbooks do. They're transmitting knowledge, but they're also, in a more practical sense, modeling knowledge and getting students to practice that knowledge in some way, ideally. Let's talk about knowledge. What is knowledge? And I think not a lot of people really get into epistemology outside of the field of philosophy and maybe uh, in sociology. Knowledge is not just a product. And when most people talk about knowledge, they think about facts. They think about this thing that represents other things in the real world, usually conveyed through li linguistic forms. Knowledge is also process, though, and this could take two forms. Knowledge, in order to arrive at facts, needs to be actively created. So scientists go through a series of steps in order to create knowledge. And so knowledge can be processed in terms of methodology. How are, the, how are those facts created? Uh, knowledge can also be processed in terms of activity. That knowledge can be an activity, an action. And so conveying how is that action done. So knowledge is not just facts. Knowledge is more than that. It's how those facts were created, or it could be the practicing of uh, an activity. And that activity could just be how to use those facts in a practical sense. So I'm going to talk about some different specific kinds of knowledge. That if for one uh, were to construct a textbook, to create a textbook, you should probably have all of these types of knowledge. Be aware of these types of knowledge, how they're different, and how they can be utilized in order to maximize student learning. So facts, obviously. Um, having information about how the world works, true information that's been verified through scientific community, obviously that's an important part of any textbook. But more than that, forms. And this is where we get into concepts, which would be ideas, uh, larger ideas about the, the topic at hand, but also how those ideas are conveyed through genres or forms, um, how to talk about uh, discourse. So you would be thinking about in this field that I'm in, that I'm trying to represent these facts, what are some of the main ideas that help kind of organize these facts together into groups? And then how, how do people in our field communicate these ideas in terms of forms of communication or discourse? And one thing a textbook can do is to model that discourse for the student, to teach them how to speak about the topic in a particular way. That it's not just the memorizing of facts, but it's also how to talk about those facts. And this is one of the areas where most textbooks, in my mind, get it wrong, and that they don't talk the way the people in the field actually talk. And so they're teaching students a way of, of, of reading and thinking that is, in some ways, different, if not the polar opposite of what actual practitioners in that field might do. Threshold concepts. This is a particular type of concept. A threshold concept is a transformative concept, that once a student learns this concept, they see the field or that topic in a completely new way. And once they see the field or topic in this new way, it's hard to go back. So for example, uh, in the field of history, often students think about history as one damn fact after another. There's a common conception of history. Just a bunch of facts that you memorize, people, places, and things. Well, one of the main things that most historians try to teach their students is to see history as a contest, a contest between actors, and that these actors have different recollections and memories and purposes. And so once students kind of see that there isn't one version of history, there isn't one set of facts, that it's a bunch of people 
that are sometimes directly opposed to each other for various reasons, and that they're each writing competing versions of history, this, this utterly changes what history is for those students. And they can never see history again as just a bunch of facts in a book, that one book contain the history. Right? Transformative concepts. So central concepts that transform a field or topic in some important way. Another type of knowledge, metacognition or reflexive knowledge. This is getting students to think about their thinking or to think about their doing if they're practicing activity. So asking them to think about process, uh, thinking about how are they understanding core concepts and terms, how are they reading the textbook, how are they using this information, um, what can they do with it, um, how is this information constructed, how do I do this activity, what are the steps, how are you learning these steps. Um, this is metacognition or reflexive knowledge and this is kind of a, a new uh, type of knowledge that's really been developed in the last 25 years uh, as psychology has, has kind of weighed in more in terms of, of knowledge and teaching and learning, but very, very important. Another type of knowledge is practices, concrete practices, and that often these practices are done in order to formulate habits, and habits, as the field of sociology has demonstrated, is an important form of knowledge that we learn how to operate our body physically, and we do so in a repeated motion for many, many days or months or years, and then our body takes over, and our brain takes over, and, and the brain aspect of habit is an important field in psychology, especially behavioral psychology um, and, and um, behavioral economics which is kind of a field in economics that is full of psychologists. So our body and our brain learns how to do practices and they become automatic. So teaching students how to do certain practices, what the steps are, what the processes are, and then teach them how to practice those things so that they can learn it as a habit. And hopefully it's a good habit that has some benefit to the student's life. Finally, a conceptual framework or a theory. And this is very important. Again, this is something that a lot of textbooks leave out. A way to organize all the other forms of knowledge, especially all those concepts and facts. You're not just throwing them at students in some kind of discombobulated way, but you're thinking about how they fit together in some connected, unified way. And you can do this with a conceptual framework that's not necessarily any kind of scientific theory that is trying to make claims about causality or trying to predict but often it can be done with a scientific theory, um, that you could connect these concepts in a way that explains how the world works in terms of governing processes or laws, depending on the field. So different types of knowledge. And then, of course, this textbook is embedded in a context, an educational context, of not just the learner who is reading the textbook, but the teacher who is teaching the textbook, and the broader academic institution in which this these practices are taking place. Uh, this is a great book that kind of talks about, in terms of higher education, what we know needs to happen in that institutional level and in the individual classroom in order for that textbook to actually foster good learning in terms of uh, the student actually um, learning the information and be able to practice whatever concrete activities that might, be, uh, might come along with it, those, those facts. So there needs to be academic challenge, that you need to find ways to challenge the students with that information, uh, with the practices that you're giving them. You need to make it active so that students need to be doing something. They're not just memorizing, they're not just reading information, but they're doing something with that information. And that's where um, sewing in concrete practices and thinking about metacognition can play a role in getting the students in terms of actively thinking about and using the information, the facts that they're being presented. Collaborative learning, getting them to interact with other students so students are learning together in a way that it reinforces their learning uh, and also keeps them in an active social state where they're participating in that learning process. Student-faculty interaction, so finding ways where the fac faculty member can actually um, participate with those students in their learning and be active in that process, not just standing in front of them lecturing, but also playing a role in facilitating that transfer of information, then helping them to think and practice that information of those practices. Um, and then larger, there needs to be a supportive campus environment that is giving the students and the instructors everything that they need in order to make the classroom experience work. And 
both inside and outside of that classroom, there needs to be enriching educational experiences. And again, thinking about education in terms of this larger practice as not just transferring information, but as an experience, an activity. And again, this goes with thinking about knowledge as not just a thing, not just a fact, but as an activity. An activity because we're social beings that needs to be engaged in with other social beings. And so to think about how we need to embed multiple layers of experience in terms of the classroom and outside the classroom to give students enriching educational experiences. And this could be structured into textbooks. Okay, so let's talk about revisioning the textbook um, away from just the traditional print copy. First of all, as I mentioned before, textbook business uh, is one of the traditional reasons why we have textbooks, and they're making a lot of money. Um, one problem that I see with traditional textbooks is the high cost, and the cost of textbooks has been rising faster than just about every other, I think, every other commodity in our, in our uh, culture, including the price of higher education tuition, which has been skyrocketing. But we can see that over the last 30 years that educational textbooks have gone up 812%. Part of the reason is just the monopoly aspect of textbooks. A professor or a classroom assigns the textbooks. Students have no choice but to buy that book. And, and if it is a textbook, um, getting that physical book, you could either borrow one or get it from the library, but you're limited in, in not paying for it. Uh, so students are often forced to buy these books. And a lot of these prices for these books are astronomically high, you know, 75 to $100, some are, you know, over $100. There's really no, if we're just talking about the commodity itself, there's no you know, reason why books have to be this expensive. That, that they have trade books, you know, that two, 300 pages, paperbacks for you know, $15, $10. Um, that part of the reason why textbooks are so expensive because there's no one, there's no way around it. And that the professor has a monopoly on, on this particular book for the class and you know, they're using one particular book that one particular company is creating. But there's some additional problems besides cost. I think cost is one of the most important that we need to be aware of, but there's some other problems with the traditional textbook. One is disciplinary conformity, and this goes back to tradi tradition. Today we, we have more textbooks than we have traditionally. Uh, in the past there was only a few textbooks available for professors to adopt. We have a lot more choice these days, but still what we find in the fields uh, whether they be scientific or in the humanities, that there's a certain amount of consensus over what should be taught. And that consensus doesn't always include everything that should be taught, especially the debates about what the disagreement is over in terms of the new areas of knowledge. So there's a lot of dis disciplinary conformity. And sometimes fields and textbooks are, are teaching information that is um, old, and this is a second uh, problem with the textbook, that this conformity, this consensus has come about over you know, years and sometimes decades. And so what the textbook contains is really where the field was at 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And so the student is being really taught out-of-date information. And you know, in order to update these textbooks, often there isn't a lot of changes, not a lot of substantial changes to these textbooks. And it does take time and money in order to revise these physical textbooks, get them out into the market. Uh, but two important problems with textbook is just the lack of diverse voices that often you get textbooks saying basically the same thing in the same way, and the information is often old. You also see uh, editorial decisions being made by marketers instead of educators or um, professors in the field that the textbook publisher is making a decision, can we sell this book? How much money will we make? Not, is this a good book? Does this contain the information students need to know in this field? And so often, textbooks will be published more for market price considerations. And this could be tied to the disciplinary conformity. This is what our audience is used to. This is the way we've been producing our books in this field. This is what they're expecting. And so if you do something different, we might not be able to sell it there might not be an audience for it. The audience might not want to buy that. And so there's decisions made based on marketplace um, factors rather than educational factors. Publisher control. 
that often with textbooks, publishers retain the copyright rather than the authors, and then that book is out of the control of the original authors, and the publisher, again, can make marketplace considerations or simply you know, keep doing what the textbook has been doing traditionally in terms of the conformity and the consensus and not updating it or revising it in the way that the author might want to do so. Another uh, problem with traditional textbook is the textbook as, a, as an object, as a physical object. Textbooks are often large and heavy, and they are somewhat difficult to transport, especially if you're transporting a lot of textbooks. So the idea of, of students carrying around a bunch of books in their backpacks is a problem, and it's something that I notice, especially with my, text, uh, with my students, not a lot of my students actually carry their textbooks around anymore. It's just, it's not a cultural practice that students are participating in as much as they used to. So this is a problem that we need to be thinking about. Um, if a student doesn't have their book with them, well then you, you can either have them borrow or they have to go without, and that creates an educational problem if that physical object is not present. And then finally, no direct connection to other texts. And this can come in two forms. Um, often, and this is a problem that I have with a lot of textbooks, there isn't a lot of um, references. Uh, they don't model good academic thinking and discourse in terms of having uh, proper citation uh, and referencing where all the information comes from. But outside of that, in terms of connecting to the other authors and the other texts that have been fed into this textbook, if a student wanted to find that information, they have to do it the old-fashioned way, which is to go to a library, look it up on the card catalog, and then find that book or article either in a database or on the bookshelf. Now, there is definitely some value to that, and certainly that is an important component of the educational process, especially in higher education. However, it is kind of an older, obsolete uh, way of getting students connected to other texts. And, and when we talk about, for example, Blackboard, and websites, the idea of hyper-connectivity, that you can have instant access to other texts that, that really makes it a lot easier for students to connect to those various voice, voices that feed into the discussion of the topic on which that textbook is based. So these are some of the problems with traditional textbook. Now, as far, uh, as, far as uh revising the textbook, revisioning the textbook, getting away from the physical book Teachers have been doing this for a while with, with, with new technology. One, one, I think, the most important newer technologies that enabled uh, teachers to get away from the physical textbook was the photocopier when that first was first developed in the 70s and early 80s, that you could simply photocopy things out of a book and then give those pages to your students. You don't need a textbook anymore, and it becomes free and easy. Now, of course, there were certain uh, copyright issues that had to be hammered out, and uh, we don't do this as much, and there are certain rules about what we can photocopy and what we can hand out, but this is and has been one way around the textbook. Make photocopies. Or make handouts, where the professor you know, turns their lecture presentation into their own words on a piece of paper, and then you give that to the student. No book is needed to buy. You just give them a piece of paper. Another technology that is sometimes replace the, power, or, or replace the textbook or just augmented it, is the PowerPoint presentation. And so here you have a text, a text that could be given to students either by email or putting it on a website, but they're getting a visual representation of the discourse that's being presented to them and the facts, and then this is either piggybacking what's in the physical textbook or it's supplementary to that textbook. But this is another way around the textbook, that the PowerPoint becomes the text. Some professors, I know, they simply use PowerPoints, and they just put that on some repository online, and then the students read and you know, go off of the, the, uh, the PowerPoint in terms of what they're memorizing. Ebooks. This is a relatively new technology that, in some ways, is beginning to replace physical textbooks. Now, ebooks have um, some benefits that traditional textbooks don't, but I see ebooks retaining a lot of the downsides of uh, physical textbooks because ebooks are still being controlled by textbook publishers. So most of the downsides that I were saying about textbooks are still contained with ebooks because those textbook publishing companies are still in control of the process. And ebooks, while they're cheaper than physical books, are still really expensive. 
Um, but there are ways to make ebooks, say as a PDF, that could make them free and easily available to students, which would bypass um, the textbook publishing company and then eliminate a lot of those problems. Uh, but ebooks could have the hyperlinks to make them interactive. Ebooks could be really cheap or free for students. Uh, and ebooks could be a quick way if they were in control of the actual writer, you could very easily update them and, and, and disseminate them. Blackboard, and I, and I know that Blackboard is a sponsor of this particular conference, and most institutions use Blackboard these days. Blackboard is like a website. It does utilize the web. However, it's a controlled website. And I think there are some problems with Blackboard in terms of it being a controlled website. And the most important problem that I see, that the website, I think, uh, is more beneficial in this, in this area, in that once a student leaves a course, that content becomes locked and they can no longer have access to it. And if we're teaching students information and processes which the textbook is modeling for them and giving them, if they lose the textbook, well then they have no, they have no access to that information if they forget, and most people do, that, that books should be a lifelong participant in a learner's you know, learning and that they, they need access to that book for the whole lot. And so I like Blackboard, and Blackboard has a lot of great features, uh, but I think the, the locked nature of Blackboard is very, very problematic, especially in terms of we thinking lifelong learning as opposed to just learning for a particular course. And then uh, MOOCs and website. And, and here, there isn't a lot of distinction between MOOCs and website. Um, I think the overlap with MOOCs, and if you're not familiar with MOOCs, massive open online courses, uh, a lot of the top universities in the world are making their courses free and available online to students, uh, Coursera, um, CourseX. Um, there's a number of these new organizations that are basically a professor lecturing, being captured on video. The video is put online. Um, the textbook is usually a collection of free articles in conjunction with buying a physical book. And then there's uh, some interaction through uh, Google Plus or Facebook or other social media. And so there is student interaction. Students are interacting with a professor via the internet. And students basically learn at their own pace. Essentially, a MOOC is a textbook, uh, an interactive textbook. And this is one of the reasons why MOOCs have very high non-completion rates is because there's no one really physically interacting with that student and kind of encouraging them through their learning. And so it's basically you, you read and follow along on your own or you don't. Uh, and if you're not highly motivated, you're obviously not going to get through the content. MOOCs like Blackboard are often controlled in that you have to go through the website and sign up for them. In many cases, they're free, which is a plus. In some cases, and this is, this is a new technology that's still in its infancy, um, there is heavy discussion in trying to push MOOCs into a fee-based model where there's either fees in order to register, which could be lower, much lower than, say, traditional higher education, or there's kind of tiers where certain content is free and then there are extras that you would pay for. Uh, for example, one of the current extras that some of these MOOCs are doing is that the course itself is free, but if you want college credit, you have to pay whatever the university says, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars, and then you can, you know, take a test that was proctored, and then you can get actual course credit by that university. So there's various ways that MOOCs are both free and fee structured, and this is still an emerging, um, an emerging process that not sure exactly where this is going to go. Um, the other problem with MOOCs is that MOOCs could be used to displace actual physical professors, and that um, some schools, some administrators are seeing MOOCs as a way that you know students could watch the famous professor, and then you just have rather than a physical professor, just some tutor or someone who is kind of in the classroom helping the students learn information that's coming from a third source. So websites, which is the specific uh, revisioning of the textbook that I want to talk about, it's very similar to eBooks, Blackboard, and MOOCs. What I see the benefit of the website, so it contains all the benefits that you would get in eBooks, Blackboard, MOOCs, 
Um, Blackboard has a lot of you know integrated learning technologies that can be used in terms of grades and whatnot. Now, if one had the time and resources, there's no reason why a website couldn't also have that. And that you could have, say, Blackboard connected to a website where there are certain things like grades, for example, that could be closed, but then the rest of it could be open for the duration of you know, a student's life that they could always go back to that website and, and access all the information that's there. Um, the website, depending on who was authoring the website, could be more beneficial than the MOOCs and that the websites could be under the direct control of the professor. And so they're not, it's not being used to displace that professor. Uh, it's not in the control of, of an administrator. Uh, the professor could you know, decide what goes on the, uh, the textbook or not. Uh, but in many ways, I think the website is more beneficial because, again, it takes away cost that the students don't have to be enrolled in the class to have access to the information. Uh, they don't have to be enrolled in the university to have access to the information. They don't have to purchase anything to have access to the information. Now, there are ways, again, that, that certain aspects of it could be closed in terms of you know, facilitating grades or some kind of specific classroom activities. But one of the big virtues, I think, of the public website is that it's public, and that it's a public good, and that it's there for students to use for as long as they want to use it. Um, it's also easy to revise. And again, if it was under the control of a professor or a university department, that it, it's very easy to update a website. Uh, and that the, you know, the, the, the revisions are instant as soon as you click the button. So there's no longer process for that to ebook or that uh, physical book to have to go through the printing stages or the delivery stages. You want something new, you, you, you make the change, and it's up. Data tracking. Uh, now, this is a, a, a very good feature that you get with Blackboard, that there's lots of ways that we can track student movements. Again, if you know and have the resources, there are ways that you can uh, data track using websites. And there are a lot of, you know, with, with uh, the website hosting people like uh, Yahoo, for example, that they actually have uh, elementary data tracking tools available to you for free that come along with, with this hosting website. There's more advanced forms that you can also pay for. Uh, a benefit to websites uh, that also can be found at both MOOCs and Blackboard is the idea of multimodality, that, that it's not just print, but you can also include audio and video. And this is something that I use in my particular website that um, there's lots of video clips and audio clips, or sometimes a combination of the two, where that you can engage students in multiple forms of learning. And because it's online and that you can use hyperlinks, that you're able to bypass copyright limitations by simply inserting a hyperlink rather than having to go through the formal uh, copyright um, forms in order to you know, reproduce material. Because you're not actually reproducing it, you're just linking to it. You have the entire web at your fingertips. And so it's very easy and cheap to connect to multiple types of information. Um, now, Something that I like about the multimodality of websites, uh, rather than Blackboard, I find Blackboard incredibly um, clunky in terms of its visual organization. That uh, Blackboard is just full of you know lines, and it has kind of an old HTML feel to me when I when I look at at Blackboard. The nice thing about websites is that you can actually design them to be more visually appealing and, and to incorporate design aspects so that they're easier to read. And the information, uh, it doesn't just have to be in the text. You can use pictures. And there's, there's all sorts of ways that you can, you can think in terms of artistic visual communication and open up a way to transmit that, that information visually in new ways that Blackboard really doesn't allow you to do. And a lot of these MOOCs are not even thinking about that because they're not you know, being, being uh, created by um, people that know about visual communication. But that's, a, that's an additional good that I see with websites is there's a lot more uh, room to insert that artistic visual communication that you do get with physical textbooks. That's in the best physical textbooks. Design is an important aspect, and, and the color and the layout and the, the font and the size, it, that's all an important process, important part of the process of getting students to learn and making those texts very readable. Um, and then finally, just again, the hyperlinks uh, is very important. I think that there's so much free information out there. If we can design a portal that will link students to that free information, and not only that, 
Uh, I, in the website I'm going to show you, uh, teach uh, critical thinking and argument. There's a lot of bad sources, and I tell my students that 95%, if not 99% of what's on the internet is crap, that you should never trust, to have links to information you can trust. And so the website becomes an authoritative portal to not only free, but trusted websites that you can trust that going to these places you're going to get more uh, relatively you know, valid information. Okay, so this is a book that I wrote, 21st Century Literacy, uh, Constructing and Debating Knowledge in Multicultural Societies. Let me just show you the website real fast, and then we can go into questions. So I, I shopped this book around a bit to some traditional academic publishers. Uh, Cambridge University Press really liked it. There's a couple reasons um, that they turned me down or I turned them down. One was having control over the content. There is a lot that my textbook does that no other textbook in my field, or really any field, does. Uh, and I didn't want to not do it. Uh, I thought it was very important. Uh, one of which is not only do I teach um, the core concepts of literacy, critical thinking, and argument, but I also teach students about the university and uh, the perils of, of not graduating from university, some of the statistics and some of the reasons why students drop out, as well as what students need to do in order to prepare themselves. No textbook does that. Um, a lot of uh, higher education institutions are beginning to create these, these introductory classes that kind of teach students about the university and the different academic disciplines and what is an academic discipline and, and how do you choose one. I know UTSA is just initiating these courses. Um, I think they started last year. They're continuing to expand. Um, academic inquiry is the name of this course. But a lot of universities realize we have high dropout rates. In most cases, half of students, uh, half of uh, college students in our country drop out. And a big reason is that they're not prepared and they don't know how to be successful. And so that's one of the things I really wanted to do in a textbook is to teach students about how to be a college student. Um, and another aspect of the book that uh, publishers wanted that I did not, because of the content and how my book was a lot different than a lot of other books, they wanted to make it very, very expensive. And I said, no. You know, I, I definitely wanted something like, uh, in my field, there's a really small book from Norton called They Say, I Say, which I absolutely love. It's like $15 in its basic version. Something really, really cheap. Um, something small, easy to read, cheap. Um, and that was a, a point that these publishers weren't willing to negotiate on. And so I was thinking about my options, and I figured, you know, what I can do is just put it online, make it free. And that's what I did. Um, so I created a website. I used uh, Yahoo because Yahoo was a uh, company that I'd used for my own personal website in the past. And they have very easy-to-use tools that can help you design various layouts, um, you know, color, schemes that are artistically pleasing. You don't really have to think about it because they have kind of already mapped that out for you in various templates. But if you wanted to, uh, you could do your own thing or you could hire someone else to create your website and then you know, transfer it over. Um, I put the entire textbook on the web. Another thing that I did that most textbooks don't is I specifically put in-text citations because in teaching academic writing, I'm trying to model for my students how academics actually write, and I'm using APA because it represents a more scientific genre of sci uh, citation that most students will actually use in their life. Rarely do you see in a textbook in-text citations. And this, in my mind, is one of the major drawbooks of most academic textbooks, is they're not modeling real academic discourse. So when students actually get to uh, an academic article or an academic book, they're not entirely sure about how to use it. Uh, so if you can incorporate, again, that's part of the process of information, incorporate that into the textbook, then as they read, they're learning how to read citations as they're reading the textbook. And one of the sections that I talk about in the, in the book is citations. And so they're, they're learning about different forms of citations, a little bit about the history of the citations. And then notice that as the student is reading, there are these yellow underlined words, and these are hyperlinks to other places. So when I talk about history or I talk about certain people, um, things that you might assume a student already knows about, well, maybe they don't. And in most cases, they don't. So here's an easy, quick way for a student to get information on that person. 
Um, it's also a way for me to in, in, embed, I don't know if it's on this particular page, I have um, yellow links that are in the middle, and these are handouts that I created, or charts or graphs. And of course, when I want one, it doesn't come up. But it's a good way, an easy way to disseminate handouts without having to use photocopier. That the handout is just okay. my iPad doesn't always like to pick up my numbers. Okay, so there's a handout. That rather than me photocopying a handout and giving that to the class, the handout is online. No photocopy is necessarily needed. Students can photocopy if they want, but it's an easy, quick way. If I want to make a new handout, just make the handout, put it on the web, there's there. You know, I don't have to worry about it. Um, so hyperlinks connecting to information that, um, that you have created as the content creator of the textbook or other information that might be available on the web. And then in terms of, of having links to other trustworthy sources. So for example, MOOCs. I have a page, and this is where students can access MOOCs if they want to. And it has a list of many of the providers of MOOCs like uh, uh, Coursera, but also I have some direct links to Yale, MIT, where students can go directly to the institution and then go and take a class if they wanted to. Uh, so I think that a website is a very beneficial way to get around the traditional constraints of the physical textbook, and especially in terms of costs, that a website is free, and in terms of longevity, that it's always going to be there as long as you're hosting it. And so you're giving students access to information that you're teaching them how to use this information so that they can learn it, so they can practice it in their own lives and develop in whatever the particular field or topic is, and then it's always there for them to come back to that they always have access to it. And again, it's not limited to that physical book, which can be damaged or lost or just disintegrate. This information is always there, so it's permanent. And I think those two aspects really make the web as a textbook one of the most important and valuable sources of disseminating information. And I think given the high costs of higher education, especially thinking about ways to make aspects of higher education cheaper or free should be an important consideration that most professors and administrators should be thinking about. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and we can take a few minutes for questions before you have the next. So I assume there's like these textbook lobbyists that are like the tobacco lobbyists. <laughs> <laughs> Don't they come to your office every day? I know that. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm so sure... Well, I mean, so I know, I, I, just give me an example from my own experience here teaching at UTSA, for example. So I, I use this website in my own teaching. Now, what I can't do is I can't just use my website. Uh, my dean and my, my chair are actually a little bit skeptical about me using information that I've authored. And I, and I thought about this argument, and it just to me it's nonsensical because... I, I'm a researcher, I write, I you know, publish academic papers and conference papers, and either I'm an authoritative person that knows this information that's been hired by an institution to teach this information, and that there's no problem when I give my students handouts, but once the handout is on you know, a more permanent platform, then somehow there's a problem. So I know that in administrators, we have this textbook, or we have these lists of approved textbooks. Um, this could interfere with that bureaucratic process or that traditional process. Um, the authority of the individual, for example. Um, what right do you have to write a textbook as an instructor? Are you knowledgeable enough to write a textbook? And I think, I mean, that is an important consideration and question that should be asked, but again, either someone does have authority to teach and that's why they're in front of those students in the first place, or they don't. And if they do, well, then there's many ways for them to transmit their information, one of which is using a website. So, I mean, I, I don't see the textbook companies, per se, as the main roadblock. I see more of the bureaucratic structure of 
the, the institution, the school, as the main roadblock. Well, as many administrators and bureaucrats do, they, they are, they, I mean, the, reasoning doesn't always penetrate the bureaucratic mind. And so they, I got a lot of blank stares and say, but this is policy, this is what we do here. And so I have to negotiate policy and bureaucracy with what I want to do in my classroom. Um, so. Um, formulating a reasonable argument and, and you know trying to present evidence for why that argument is reasonable and presenting that to an administrative type doesn't really get you that far all the time. So, do you have an issue in your class since you use this not totally, but with students who do not have access? Yeah. Have yeah. So I, what I find is. Just about all my students, if not all my students, have either a smartphone or a laptop. And, and one of the benefits is that often when I, had, when I was just using physical books, half the class wouldn't bring their books. And that presented a big problem for me as a teacher. No one can ever forget their book anymore. There's no excuse. And I find this really helps me teach better and for them to learn better because the book is always there. You forgot your book, pull out your phone. Right? And there's the textbook. Um, so. That really hasn't a problem, and to the extent that maybe a few students don't have a smartphone or a laptop, just about everyone else does. And so it's much easier to partner up. But if you, know, you have half the class without textbooks, then partnering up with someone with a textbook becomes a bit more difficult. Uh, and then everyone has access to a computer, some, you know, the library, or you know, it's, it's easier to find access, I think, to a computer than, say, a library that has two or three copies of a textbook or a book. Um, that you know, there's thousands of computers on that campus. There's you know thousand textbooks. Yeah. You also find that somewhere, and I'm sure you've seen this somewhere, halfway down the line in the class, you find you have students in the class who've never purchased a textbook mm -hmm. because it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. I found this in, in the, I, I was able to get all my textbooks for my class in the spring for less than forty dollars. And the advisor said, you know, this is one of the big issues that you know some of the students were dropping classes they signed up for because they found out once they got in there. That the books cost right. so much money. Right. The books were listed, you know, two or three hundred dollars for books for one class. And you really just can't afford to do that. Yeah, so. it's crazy. Yeah. And, and waiting to purchase a textbook, you know, because scholarships come in, so they don't have access to a textbook for the first two or three weeks, you know. I audited a course this semester, and on the first day, the professor had one of the students post the PDF of the book on his personal PSA. <laughs> All the computer science students get their own little area. He had him write his thing on the board, and everyone in the class downloaded the PDF and put the first. Why didn't he put it on Blackboard? Yeah, huh. yeah. The teacher was like, "I don't like the way I don't like the whole the way books are handled, so I'll just we'll give it away to you." Oh, the photo. They actually photocopied the book, and no, it was a PDF of the book. Oh, of the book. Oh, yeah. But by giving it to the student, they were able to get around. I'm around my book, I'm like, are we on camera? <laughs> <laughs> No names were mentioned, so you're yes. safe. But uh, I think it's, uh, I want to say 30% is the rule in terms of copyright, that uh, as long as you do not re re reproduce over 30%, you're safe as an educator within an educational institution. 30% of whatever, well, 30% of the length. So if, you know, often books have around 10 chapters, so that equates roughly three chapters. But I think it, the Supreme Court ruled more of a percentage than they did a, a chapter. There was a recent uh, court case. What's the... What was the sweet spot for your class in you were wanting to make your own content and the administrator was saying you want some additional content? So how much of what was the... It's an ongoing negotiation. One thing that I... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one thing that I do is I, I let my students know they can purchase the textbook or they can use this book and that they, they're roughly covering the same material and that I think mine will say it uh, clear, and, and it will also talk about certain things that the textbook won't. Um, so I, I let them purchase the textbook if they want to, and I put the textbook and all of the pages where that information is on the syllabus. So to a certain extent, what the administration wants me to do, it's all there in the syllabus. I am using that textbook. And, and from time to time, for certain areas where I have no qualms with what's in the textbook, I'll use the textbook on a day and say, bring the textbook, and we, we'll look at these pages. 
there's a lot in my book that is just not in any textbook in my field. And so this, it's either this or bring in uh, articles. And, and I do you know, put a lot of articles on Blackboard, some of which you know, I can't find freely linked on the web. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to do more. I, I'm not really, I haven't done a lot this with, with linking to specific um, articles and whatnot. But that's one addition I want to make to the, the website is to link to some of these articles I use in my class to teach my students. Um, but, you know, if there are institutional requirements about using a textbook, you know, you can put those on the, on the syllabus and incorporate your own. And, and you could just say it's, I mean, it's just a handout. And, and you could put the handouts on Blackboard and the website. And you're just saying, here's just one other vehicle for me to use to get information to my students, if that was a problem. Right, you're, you're making money. Exactly. And that was another issue that the, <laughs> the, the dean had raised, is that, you know, there's a conflict of interest, and, but I, guess I said it's free. I'm not, I'm not yeah, they, I mean, it's just, it's, it, it's a public good. Yeah, and then certainly I probably could, if I wanted to, do a, a you know the whole faculty approval of a you know your own personal textbook form. I don't I didn't feel I needed to do that, uh, but I could try to go through that process if I really wanted to. I get that from the, that comment from a couple students usually. Why are we using this, this guy's textbook? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's not selling the selling aspect, but but there is this idea that you know we're just listening to your voice, and to a certain extent. But that's what you do in a college classroom, right? And and this is information I would be lecturing to you. And that I don't really do much lecturing in my courses, that I, I have them read the text and then I usually do small group discussion and then um, have the small groups come together and then we kind of talk about you know, these discussion questions together. So it's a way for me to give them the information I want them to hear that I would put in a lecture on a place that well, it's not me lecturing at them. So they can, they can read it you know, at their own pace, reread it if they need to, unlike a lecture where you're just listening. So it essentially is a written lecture. Uh, augmented with in-text citations and hyperlinks that conveys information that I would be physically, I'm not wasting that time. I can use my class time to facilitate learning instead. Um, so I think there are many rational arguments that one could use that would, um, you know, alleviate any fears about how websites could be misused or abused um, that I think as long as one can accept that the person in front of the students is an authoritative person who belongs there, then any mode at their disposal to do their job should be okay. And I think this is a great new medium to disseminate information. Any other questions or comments? And if you have any you know, additional specific questions about the website or you know, uh, how you can make one of your own, feel free to email me. Uh, the card takes you to the website that I gave you. There's more cards back there if you want to take them. But my, my, there's a bio page that has my personal email as well on, on the website if you want to contact me. Um, I'm going to actually, I'll put this PowerPoint on my personal website. So my personal website has all my conference presentations. So that's jmbeach at jmbeach.com. Any other questions? All right, have a good day.